I'm Greg Enholm. I have been a Bay Point resident for more than 16 years. Here is our welcome sign. In this upcoming video, you will see a meeting held by our Bay Point Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce, of course, is very interested in attracting new members and would love to have you attend their meetings. In the legislature, he worked to protect and increase education funding, improve student health, ensure school safety, cut the job dropout rate, and develop the largest system of after-school programs in the nation. Born in San Francisco, Superintendent Torlakson served in the United States Merchant Marine, earning the Vietnam Service Medal. He lives in Pittsburgh with his wife, May, and has two grown daughters and one grandson. And so I'm very honored to uh, have Tom here with the Big One Chamber. Tom, please. We're together in common projects and common goals for our communities for so many years. May says hi, by the way, so she's at work. She was with me in San Jose earlier this morning. We had uh, a meeting with educators and Latino administrators of California, and then uh, dropped her back off at Oakland where she works uh, with the University of California. So we're fortunate to live in the great community of Pittsburgh, and the Bay Point Pittsburgh community is truly a marvelous place. We're caring people build a better life for themselves and their kids and uh, you're all part of that because I look around the room I see go-getters I see you know people have just dedicated you're all connected as the introductions show you're connected to different service clubs and, and different businesses that are investing in the community so uh, I, I want to say congratulations thank you and I'm delighted to be here today and so I will give a short overview but because many of you, I think, have questions, comments, and everybody has an opinion about education, right? We all went to school, and we remember what it was like. Uh, and I'll, I'll start by just saying, while we are in crisis, and we are in a fiscal crisis, and our state and our nation has been in some very terrible economic times. And people have suffered with the loss of their homes, the loss of their retirement, their 401k evaporated. Uh, whatever it's been, uh, it's been rugged for several years. Our, our schools have lost 25%. Our K-12 schools that I'm responsible for, the 10,000 schools in our K-12 system, have lost 25% uh, of their funding, which is about $20 billion. And we were just talking here as we were looking at um, the good student at Cal State University who works with General Chemical right now, that, that they, they're not able to offer courses in higher ed. You know, courses that should be offered once a year, twice a year. It's what is it? A course you need to get your health credential is has been offered for two years. So many of our young, uh, our kids and our nieces and nephews are taking, you know, five and a half to six years to get through college because of that, which is an economic burden on the students who take out loans, on the parents who uh, pony up a lot of money when they can. Uh, so we have this crisis, but I want to say that while these troubles have been going on, I'm constantly amazed and inspired by how Californians are resilient and are responding and how educators particularly have the attitude, these students are coming. They're going to walk through the door, you know, school starts at 8 or 8.15 or 7.45 and we need to be ready for them and we need to give them everything we can give them in terms of our knowledge, our passion, our understanding and skills that those students will need. And so I see despite the crisis and, you know, in a crisis, uh, you can either sit on your hands or wring your hands or bemoan fate, or you can seize the opportunities, because every crisis does have opportunities. Those of you in business uh, obviously know that. Terry knows that, you know, running a park district. Judy knows that, running Ambrose Park and Rec District. There are opportunities there, too. And so despite the fact that we see this decline in revenues, it, it has forced a rethinking of how we spend our money, how we prioritize what we do. And, and that's been uh, really encouraging uh, to see. There's so many innovative things going on. I'll, I'll just you know, cite a few uh, and, and then talk about the bigger picture. What we're, we're seeing is a shift towards what we call 21st century learning skills, uh, which is really positive. It's, it's the skills that employers are looking for. Uh, it's not the stage on the stage where a teacher gets up in front of 
you know, 35 or 40 students in lectures, and maybe you're hitting a third of the class or 40 percent of the class, but there may be, you know, 20 percent, 25 percent that are behind a year or two in that subject. They're, for whatever reason, their start in life wasn't as good as others. Uh, they they got behind. Their parents may not speak English. They may have come from poverty, or they don't have books at home, and didn't have a tradition of reading and literacy in that home. Uh, but you have this this uh, this uh, range of, of what's what's going on. In the 21st century learning skills, instead of this uh, one-way delivery and students take notes, memorize, and take multiple choice tests, it's really about critical thinking, problem solving, teamwork, good communication skills, knowing you need to write because you need to communicate. When you're in a workplace, when you're part of a team, you need to have those skills. And then one of my big pushes is also to really focus on relevancy to our education. And I think that's what parents want. They want their students to graduate with skills so they can be employed. Uh, May and I are lucky we have four youngsters between us that are now in their 20s, late 20s and 30s. Uh, thank God we got them all through college and they're all employed. Yay! <laughs> but there's a lot of young people who are coming home and through their 20s and even their early 30s and they're, they're staying at home because they didn't get skills for the jobs that are out there. So th this idea of career technical education, you remember the old shop classes they used to call it vocational education? Well, those were great classes. And for when we had um, Dow and DuPont and, and U.S. Steel before it was U.S.S. Bosco, and you, you had you know, Fiberboard and Crown Z, uh, you, you had a different kind of a, a economic base. And you didn't need to have some of the more advanced math and uh, cognitive thinking skills uh, in those jobs. You, you, you needed good, smart people who worked hard and, and, and could learn the job well. Uh, but those jobs have shrunk a lot. And many have disappeared. The new economy demands a different kind of skill set. And so I, I'm pleased to see that our, our schools are uh, responding and providing that kind of education. I want to tell you by the end of my con presentation about solar suitcases. But I'll give you, so stay tuned for uh, about solar suitcases. But we have, for instance, in California, uh, and I'm fighting to expand it, I pushed for it when I was in the Senate, uh, partnership academies. Uh, we have Dozier Libby out in Antioch, and, and many schools have done these partnership academies where they hook up a, a th on a theme, construction. That's all I know about this. Uh, we, we have uh, pre-engineering, architecture, and all the trades, everything about the building. And students in, in a, in a pre-engineering academy, they'll read about the building of pyramids and cathedrals that sometimes took hundreds of years, and building the bridges, and going out and watching the bridges being built right here in the Bay Area, which is pretty fascinating, isn't it? Uh, and they, they have choices when they're done with this career. They know why they have to do the math, because it relates to building things. And if you don't know uh, geometry, kind of be a carpenter or put a, put a big skyscraper together. It doesn't work too well unless you know your math. So there's relevancy. And there's, in those cases, the students are motivated. They're not dropping out. They're not becoming part of the dropout statistics that lead to the youngsters that are lost and going to drugs and going to gangs and going to jail. And so that's, uh, that's heartening to, to see that the graduation rate's up more like in the 95%. You know, the statewide graduation rate's 76%. But in parts of Pittsburgh, uh, parts of Richmond, Oakland, South Central Los Angeles, uh, parts of San Diego City, the graduation rate's only 50%. And in some ethnicities, it's only 40, 45% in Latino and African American young men. And, and so we see a turnaround when you bring education more relevant and that they see a career path. The one, the Dozier Libby example in Antioch is around healthcare, it's around medical sciences. So you learn everything, all your studies and literature and reading relate around a, a, a career path. And then you, young people get motivated and say, that, I'm going that way, that's my dream, I'm going to fight for it, work for it, and that's, that's good. So those are uh, some of the, the positive things I see. Graduation rates, I just put out a report, again, despite all the cuts, uh, went up a percent and a half statewide. Uh, but for English learners, it went up 3% for African American and Latino students, it went up 2.5%. And so uh, that's a long way from having a 90% graduation rate, but it's headed in the right direction. 
And guess what? What if we've given our schools the monies they used to have, they deserve to have, and how much more our students could be succeeding? But uh, one high school I visited is uh, Lincoln High School in Stockton. And there the students are working with technology. I want to mention some more about this, but the te technology is revolutionary. It's a game changer. Uh, computers, the smart boards, the internet access, the learning programs that, that tell you as a, as a student and tell the teacher who can check where you are in that math program or that language program, they tell you exactly what you need to do and they have fun games and exercises that, that guide you right along to where you are. Well, Lincoln High School, it's a construction academy around building things and they, they, build, they build out frameworks for houses and roofs uh, on campus and then they assemble them on the weekends with Habitat for Humanity. And so the students are really jazzed about, they're actually hands-on, they love it. And there's an equal number of boys and girls uh, in the class. And so, uh, again, through these construction academies, some of them may want to go on and be that architect to build you know, the next bridge uh, that's going to dazzle people and, and provide a great transportation link. Uh, or they may want to be a plumber or carpenter, and by the way, that's a pretty good living. When does your plumbing break down? Mine is always on Saturday and Sunday. When they handle the bills, right? They make a pretty good living there. So it seems like it's $150 or $200 an hour or something. Anyway, but they, they also at this school uh, uh, have, remember the old drafting board? Some of you remember that us back in well, no, nobody here, maybe Harry and I are old enough to know this, but, but they have CAD computer aided drawing. They use computers. So they can construct a, a transit hub. They can look at Bay Point and Pittsburgh and look at what it would like to be like with different story buildings and, and different sized uh, uh, and different functional uh, buildings. Uh, they just get really excited. In fact, two of the students at Lincoln High have started their own home remodeling business. With a CAD computer aided drawing, you can go into a room and look at it at different angles. Uh, you can take this wall out, move this over there. And you can almost see it in three dimensions, and, and it, these students are really adept at it. And so th those kind of things are encouraging to me to see motivated teachers and motivated students working together. Uh, a couple of things I'll just mention. Uh, I created a blueprint for great schools. It's on my CDE website, California Department of Education website. And this lays out this 21st century learning direction. We also have a big initiative on STEM, prepare more young people to become our engineers and our scientists. Uh, we have a big, uh, again, a big push on education technology. Uh, I want one-to-one -one computing capacity that every student, every classroom in this state should have access to a computer uh, all day long during the regular day and after school and on the weekend. And I went down to a little place called Mendota and uh, they're finding the way. They're, they're get, get, getting getting the computers into the hands of students. As a freshman, you get a computer, you get it all four years. Uh, you get to keep it. And they have programs with uh, Comcast and ATT, uh, where if there's a certain level of poverty, they, 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 they have Wi-Fi for free. They, so they, these students are connected to the internet in a little tiny farm town called Mendota, uh, out in the blazing hot uh, ag area of, of the state. Uh, but they're connected, and by the way, the kids in that school uh, took the national chess championship wow, wow. and the national Mesa competition. My wife, you know, works for Mesa Math, Engineering, Science Achievement, and these students put together a wind energy machine. The challenge, they have a challenge where different uh, classes, Mesa programs around the state and around the nation, uh, they have a set of plans and they're given like three weeks to design different ways to lift things, move things using wind energy. They get a fan and figure out different things. Well, these students here in Mendota uh, did it. So it was very cool. Um, by the way, we call this initiative No Child Left Offline. <laughs> I like that one. A few things on the money front, because uh, we're, we're very strong on early learning. We've got to get our kids especially our kids from poverty, to have access to quality childcare and preschool. Uh, so that other countries of the world recognize preschool is key to the success of students. So if a student enters kindergarten two years behind because their parents don't speak English, they don't have books in their house, uh, that student's in trouble. In third grade, when you get beyond 
when you get past just reading to read stories, and you have to read to know science, and you have to read to know your social studies, if you can't read, you're frustrated all day long, and you start you know, getting a, a despairing of succeeding and not, not feeling good about yourself. And those students in third grade who feel that way are the dropouts at eighth grade and ninth grade. And they become, again, the dropouts to drugs, gangs, and our prison system. So we, we do look at these things and we're saying we, we need to invest. And we have ways that work. I'll give you one other statistic. Um, in some communities, there's not a high value in education or there's trouble in their lives and the kids aren't going to school. In Oakland and in Los Angeles, uh, think about asking the question, what percentage of the kindergartners are chronically absent? This is when you're starting your life in school. Chronically absent, 19 to 20%. In kindergarten. But we know how to intervene. And Kamala Harris, the state attorney general, and I, uh, we're working with the district attorneys around the state, and we're sending letters to parents. You have a legal and moral responsibility to get your kids to school. But we're also saying there's realities. In some homes, uh, there's an elderly grandma, and somebody needs to watch her while mom's out working. And two kids go to school, but one's assigned, the yeah, third kid's assigned to stay home to watch mom. Uh, or, you know, there's no babysitter, there's a, a toddler that's you know, three years old, and you know, the, the seven, eight-year-old is saying, you stay home and watch Sally because mom's going to work, but somebody's got to watch the little one. They don't have the money for childcare. So then what we do is bring in social services to find ways to help solve those family problems or health problems. And guess what? We can turn that statistic around and drop it down to 5% chronic absenteeism instead of 20 within about four, five, seven weeks of letters, meetings. And guess what? The schools get paid more when they get more students attending school. So the program itself uh, funds itself. So anyway, th these are some of the kind of strategies. I'll mention a couple things about uh, the frugality and the uh, economic uh, reality that's hitting our schools, innovative ideas. Just one simple thing, and some of you have already done this years ago in your businesses, but uh, Chafee Joint Union High School District, a bright, new, uh, energetic 30-year-old uh, superintendent, came in and he said, there's computers on all over the place. We have eight high schools and there's computers on in all the offices. Let's put them on an automatic 15-minute shutoff when they're not used. And then you, you go back to the computer, it takes a little longer to boot it up and get it going again, they saved $300,000 just by switching to a 15-minute uh, shutoff. They saved $800,000 this way. Eight schools, all starting at 8 o'clock. The buses go out, pick up kids from this neighborhood, bring them to that high school, and this neighborhood, bring them to that. Wait a minute, they're all starting at 8 o'clock. So what if we started uh, you know, four of the schools at 7.35 and the other schools at 8.15? Well, he didn't need that big of a bus leave. He laid off a bunch of bus drivers, but that's better than laying off a bunch of uh, teachers and crowding the classrooms more. Saved $800,000 a year just by changing the bell scale. Pretty smart. So there's things like that that our administrators are, we're doing uh, joint uh, legal, instead of every district having their own attorney. Joint human resources, uh, joint planning. Uh, so a lot of, they're doing batch purchase orders together. Instead of every district going out and trying to buy for itself, they have aggregate, big scale consortium of districts going out in the marketplace and getting good prices. So these are good things that are happening, but still we're short the billions we need, and I'll just say I'm strongly in favor, and urge you to seriously consider the ballot measures coming up in November. So are we ready as Californians to invest in these kind of programs? Because we know what works. We just need some some money and some help to, to make it all work. Um, and I think, you know, we are paying 10 billion less now than we did pay 10 years ago. Part of it is the car tax, the previous governor terminated it. No pun intended. You can laugh. You remember the previous governor. Uh, or have, you, have you seen the latest new movie? He's in there with, I think, Sylvester Stallone and like 20, uh, you know, the, the, the action guys. Anyway. Um, but, but when you terminate the car tax, you blow a $6 billion hole in the budget. People used to pay. He had, you know, seven Hummers. Uh, if you have a little Volkswagen, you pay a little bit differently. Because people with a little Volkswagen that's 20 years old don't pay hardly any. But anyway, what Jerry Brown has proposed is let's, let's plug the gap in the budget. There's a chronic gap. Let's go back to restoring part of what we used to pay. Not all of what we used to pay, because these are hard times. 
and not everybody has extra dollars in their pocket, but are we willing to invest in our kids and in the future of our economy and in the future of our democracy? And that's the debate, it's an historic debate that's in front of us for the next few months to November. There's two ballot measures, one the governor has that uh, has about a, a five to seven year uh, life to it. It's a quarter cent on the sales tax and it's a upper income tax bracket, uh, income tax hit. Um, and that adds up to about eight, uh, eight billion dollars a year. So it's not even getting back to where we were 10 years ago, it's getting close. Molly Munger has a measure with the PTA uh, that is just an income tax. And it, it goes down to people who make you know, 40, 50,000 a year and you pay a little bit and if you make more, you pay more based on a graduated scale. But both plans don't really get back to even what we used to invest 10 years ago. So I'm saying, what, shouldn't we be able at least willing to invest to that level that we used to pay before? And expect and demand good value for it. Let's, let's make sure the blueprint gets implemented and these skills that parents want their kids to have, that businesses want their uh, high school graduates to have, those are skills that our kids have. So I'll, I'll be glad to answer <coughs> questions. Before I do that, I'll talk about what? Solar suitcases. Solar suitcases. Okay, so Laguna Creek High School uh, in Elk Grove, uh, this class uh, is in green technology. They put solar, they installed the solar on top of their the roof of the school. They're generating their own electricity for their classrooms. And the students are doing all kinds of things, learning all energy cycles, carbon cycles, you know, wind power, uh, fossil fuels. They're, they're very smart about anything on sustainable energy. And then this one girl said, you know, I love this class because uh, I'm visiting. And she says, I love it because we're also saving lives. And I'm saying, well, how are you doing that? Is it less greenhouse gases? No, we're, we're, we're saving lives, people who die during childbirth, moms who die during childbirth. Well, how are we doing that? So the solar suitcase are these hard shell suitcases about this dimension, something like this. And in the class, I have a drill press and a saw. And they, they have an assembly line where they, they, they take and they install a platform for a battery in this suitcase. And then they have a lamp and a cord. And then they have two solar panels that fit into the suitcase. And then they ship these suitcases to Nigeria, Liberia, India, places where there's no electricity. Where if you have an injury in the middle of the night, you're trying to give birth to a child in the middle of the night without electricity, no light, the mortality rate is extremely high. And so they have seen a dramatic turnaround. These kids in you know, this little town near Sacramento are saving lives across the globe. And they, they've, they've set up blocks with students in the, in the cities of these countries. They are communicating with the governments of those countries and asking for grants to expand the number of solar suitcases and going to foundations. And probably we'll have some of them come over to Dow. <laughs> and, but, uh, but, you know, a, but they are working in a very innovative way. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Isn't that cool? Solar suitcases. And these students also, by the way, connect through Skype to the classroom. In the urban area where they have computers and internet access, they can actually talk to those students in the other part of the world. And they share you know, the music they're listening to as well as the science and things they're doing. Isn't that cool? So I'm here to answer questions, but I just say I'm delighted to have the opportunity to serve six and a third million students in California and, and all the, 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 their aspirations of the, the students themselves and of course the dreams of their parents for what they can become. And we, we have a great system and we for the most part have valiant, hardworking teachers. Uh, we can do some things to change a little bit of that but uh, make it better. But we're on, the, on, on a course to really bring our students into the 21st century the way they should be. If you'd like to answer any questions, Brad, I don't know how you want to handle it. Yes. Great. Thank you, Brad. Thank you all. Thank you for being leaders in our community.